Well, go ahead and head in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 37. Psalm chapter 37 is where we'll be today. And as you're going there, I want to ask you a a simple question this morning. It's this, have you ever had this thought? Have you ever had this question in your own mind? Why does it seem like evil is winning? Have you ever scrolled across the headlines of a newspaper or maybe Yahoo News or you watch TV at night, the news at night, and you think, why does it seem like the wicked are always prospering? Or perhaps in your personal life, you think, why does that person always get away with living like they do? Have you ever thought like that? Maybe felt like that? To the point where you might say something along the lines of, what's the point of trying to do good, right? What's the point of, keep li- why should I keep living for God when it seems like everyone around me and everyone across the globe is just wicked and they're, they're se- they seem to be prospering? The wicked seem to be gaining ground. You think about the major world emphasis here on, on ISIS and what's happening with that. And you think of the, the huge evil there. And then you think of the small you know, evil in maybe your personal life with someone who seems to be living a wicked life and yet they seem to be prospering. You ever just wonder, what in the world is going on? Well, the Bible speaks to the issue of when evil and the wicked seem to be winning. So in Psalm 37, I want us to read this morning just a few verses, 1 through 7, but if you'll stand with me and honor God's word as we read this morning, Psalm 37, beginning in verse number 1, as we stand to honor the word of God. It says in verse 1, do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Would you bow with me as we go to the Lord? Father, we ask that you just be with us today. God, that you would speak through your word, that you would speak to every heart here, including my own. God, that you would just uh, whisper, shout, do whatever it takes to illuminate in our hearts, Lord, what you want us to hear through your word. We'll give you all the praise and glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. may be seated. I want us to get a key thought today. If you don't walk away with anything else, the key thought's on the screen. It's on your paper. It's very simple. It's something obviously you've heard before, but it's this. When evil seems to be winning, trust in the Lord. In your personal life, on the news, globally, when evil seems to be winning, trust in the Lord. And the psalmist gives us some basic instructions as to what to do when evil seems to be winning. And the first thing that he says we should do when evil seems to be winning... He says this, do not fret. Do not fret. Look at verse 1. It's the very first phrase, right? I mean, it's in black and white, very clear, very simple. Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not fret. And fret here means to burn, to get heated up. It's not just to worry. It's, It's this idea of you look around and you see the evil happening. Maybe it's a friend that is... Uh, doing something and they seem like they're getting away with it. Maybe it's on a world scale and it just seems like the evil's encroaching and there's a lot of doom and gloom in the atmosphere. And the psalmist says, listen, don't fret. Don't be, it's this idea of anger plus envy. It's the idea of looking around and saying, man, God's letting all these people get away with this. It also has a hinge of jealousy in it. The thought of, well, maybe I should do that too if they can get away with it. What's the point of me living for God? Maybe I'll do it as well. I want you to write something in your notes that's not in there, and it's this. Is there a claim, is there, I'm sorry, is there a promise to be claimed? You see, as we read the Bible, and this is one of the things we'll learn on Wednesday nights, uh, on June 10th coming up on Wednesday night, one of the things we need to do is ask some questions, and one great question to ask with Bible exposition and, and getting out of the Bible what God wants us to get is to ask the question, is there a promise to claim? And so with this passage, I want to simply ask, is there a promise to claim? And actually, there's three promises. And the first promise is this. Promise number one is this. God will punish the wicked. God will punish the wicked. Verse two, he says, for they, speaking of the wicked and wrongdoers and evildoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass 
and fade like the green herb. What is he saying? He's saying they have an end. There's going to be a time and a place when their wickedness, when their evil, when their wrongdoing, when all their things against God will come to an end. In verse 10, if you scroll down, it says, Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. You see, one of the first promises we know throughout Scripture, and specifically in this passage, is that God will punish the wicked. Now, that's both, both comforting and terrifying, right? Why is that both comforting and terrifying? Because in one sense, we're all wicked, right? We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But this is specifically speaking to the person who is unrepentant, who has heard about the salvation message of God, who has been prompted maybe by the Holy Spirit and has turned away and said, no, I'm going to continue to live wicked. I'm going to continue to do what I want to do. I'm going to continue in my way. And God says, for that person, rest assured, there will be an end. Don't be short-sighted. Judgment is coming. Don't focus on the bad news, the evil, the corruption, the people that seem to be getting away with these things. No, when evil seems to be winning, don't get discouraged or angry or envious or jealous or tempted to give up. Remember, God is just and he will punish the wicked. Now, that seems a little harsh, but we must remember in this whole context that God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to forgive us. And so anyone that is punished on that day when their time is up and when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, when they stand before God and God says, I'm sorry, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He has every right to say that because he has given every opportunity through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, for them to get forgiveness. So God's mercy is shown even in his justice. But the thing that we need to understand as believers is we do not need to fret. Don't get hung up, man. Don't get hung up on the news. And, and you get people who, man, they stockpile their, their garages and their basements with guns and with, you know, ammo and, and food supplies and water. Listen, that, that's not a bad thing, right? It's okay to be prepared. But when you start to fret so much about evildoers around you in the world and all the things going on in the world that you stop trusting in God, that's when it becomes a bad thing. And God says, and the psalmist says, do not fret. When evil seems to be winning, do not fret. But then he turns his attention. I don't know if you notice this, but there's a a shift in focus in verse 3. And it's as if he, he, he turns his attention to the individual and he says, listen, here's the part where you worry about yourself. He says, don't fret. Worry about yourself. And then he gives us some very practical steps how we can make sure that we're right and that we are not focused on fretting or worry or the evil around us. And he says this, he says, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Verse 3, trust in the Lord. (laughs) And do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. You see, when we are fretting, we are not trusting, are we? When your mind is constantly on the things of the world, when your mind is constantly on your business, whether it's going to succeed or not, when your mind is constantly on that person that seems to be getting away with everything, they're getting away with murder and God's not punishing them, when your mind is on every, all those other things, when your mind is on, oh man, is the world going to come to an end? You know, all those things, when you're fretting, 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 you know what it means? It means you're not trusting. And so he goes from a negative command, he says, listen, don't fret, to a positive command. And he says, listen, instead, trade in your fret with trust. Trust in the Lord. And then he has the phrase, and do good, which is interesting because the seeming winning of the wicked is never an excuse for the righteous to forget to do good. You see, just because other people are doing bad, just because it seems other people are getting away with things, just because it seems like the world is maybe coming to an end, doesn't excuse us from continuing to do good and trusting in the Lord. He basically says, keep on keeping on. Keep going. Don't quit. Keep doing good, even in the face of evil. But how do we do this? How do we trust in the Lord? Do we do it blindly? We just say, okay. You see, most people, most pastors, most people will say, just trust in God. He's got it all in control. But they give you no reason to trust him, right? 
But you see, when God calls us to trust him in his word time and time again in the Bible, he calls us to focus on who he is. How do we trust in the Lord? By focusing on God's character. That's the first way we trust in the Lord. It doesn't make any sense to trust in somebody to protect you who's 100 pounds, soaking wet, has never thrown a punch in their life, walks around kind of scared, can't even protect themselves, has been beat up. I'm speaking of myself, of course, at this time. No, you're like, you're not 100 pounds. You're like three times. You know, it doesn't make any sense to trust in somebody like that. But listen, when you know the character of somebody, when you know who they are, what they're like, how they act, their very attributes and who they are as a person, then you can begin to trust them. And God says, listen, when evil comes, trust in me. Lean on my character. Lean on my attributes. So I have a question for you this morning. What attributes of the Lord might be good to focus on when evil seems to be winning? What are some characteristics, some attributes of God that would be good to focus on and think on when that news comes on and it just seems like the world is going to come to an end? Or that person gets away with another thing and you're just like, man, what in the world? I can't believe they got away with that. What attributes of God's character would be good to focus on? Any ideas? He's a strong tower. I like it. Anything else? Sorry, what? He's our rock. Excellent. Anything else? What, what would be appropriate for him in this situation? When we have to trust in him, when the enemy is pressing in, absolutely, he's our strong tower. He's our rock, right? What about he is just? Right? We go back to that first verse because he says, do not fret. Evildoers, they will have an end, right? And we can look on at our, at our enemies even. We can look on at the evil in life, at the people who maybe mock God, and we can have pity for them. Because judgment day is coming. And it's not going to be pretty, right? Listen, it doesn't mean we condone what they do. It doesn't mean we bless what they do. But you can look and say, listen, I remember that God is just. He is righteous. He is like a judge who judges perfectly. So God will do what's right. God will repay. Listen, somebody's wronged you. What does God say about that? He says, listen, it's, it's mine. I get to repay. I get to, to, to judge out judgment. You, you don't worry about that. You let me do that. You worry about yourself. You focus on my character. You think about God's goodness. That might be another one. God is not letting anyone get away with anything. He's not going to let the wicked go unpunished. We've just seen that. Think about his provision maybe. When the world seems like it's caving in, listen, God's got you under his wing. He's, got, he's in control. It's okay. You don't have to focus on that. You don't have to fret. You see how trusting and looking at the very character of God changes your perspective? Do you see that? Say amen. And he asks us and he commands us to dive into who he is, Jehovah Jireh. I would encourage you, if you've never done this, get a book on the names of God. And I've preached on this before. And just search and research the names of God and claim the names of God in areas of your life. Like Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. He's never going to not provide for your basic needs. It doesn't mean you're going to get the Lamborghini you want, right? <laughs> the multi-mansion, a million dollars. No, but he'll provide for your basic needs. Verse 3, he continues, trust in the Lord and do good. And then he says this phrase, dwell in the land and cultivate what? Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Your version might say something a little bit different. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. And that phrase, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness, is very poignant in this passage because you have to think about the context. What was happening here? What's happening in the midst of this context? What's happening is, is there's enemies all around. The wicked seem to be prospering. You see, at, at points in Israel's history, there are times when it seemed like only they were the only people that were doing any good. You ever been there? <laughs> I mean, I feel like the last Christian in the world, right? You ever felt like that? You look around, you look at society, and you're like, what's gone wrong? What in the world has happened to our culture? And you see, Israel kind of felt like this in a way, and they saw the wicked, and they saw the wicked prospering, and the Lord says to him through the psalmist, listen, dwell in the land. That seems a little out of place, right? What do you mean dwell in the land? That's kind of weird. Here's what he's saying. Don't run away. 
Just stay where you are. Trust in me. Even when the enemy seems like they're winning, stay in the land. Don't run. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't get scared. Don't hightail it out of the land. I promise this to you. Stay here. Stay where you are and trust in me. So if that can be true in the life of the Israelites, it can be true in your life too. When the enemy comes, when wickedness seems to encroach upon you, you can say, you know what, I'm going to stand firm where I am. I'm going to stand fast where I am. I'm not going to run away. You might be tempted to throw in the towel, but don't. The latter part of that verse says, and feed on his faithfulness, or another translation is, and cultivate faithfulness. How many of your translations at the end of verse 3 say, enjoy safe pasture? Anybody's translation say that? Enjoy safe pasture? Anybody's translation say, live securely? Got one over here. Anybody's translation say, and feed on his faithfulness? Anybody say that? What about cultivate faithfulness? That's the New American Standard Version, and I like that the best because it gives, I think, the best image for me to really understand what he's saying here. He's saying, listen, cultivate faithfulness. What does it mean to cultivate? It means to develop a skill or quality. He's indicating this is something that has to be worked at. Trust in God, faithfulness to God. It doesn't just happen, right? It doesn't just appear, You have to cultivate it. You have to work at it. You have to develop it. He says cultivate faithfulness. That's the second way. When we say how do we trust in the Lord, the first way is by focusing on God's character. The second way is by cultivating faithfulness. Here's what cultivating faithfulness means. You're in a sticky situation. And you're here and the enemy's attacked you and you seem like, it seems like everything's going wrong. Your world's caving in. The wicked are prospering. You look around, people are getting away with murder and you're like, what in the world? Why am I even doing good? God says, listen, first of all, trust in me, continue to trust in me, dwell in the land, don't run away, don't run away, don't run away. But while you're staying there, while you're dwelling in the land, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be faithful to me. And as we're faithful to God, God is faithful to us. And as we're faithful to God, God is faithful to us. And as we're faithful to God, God is faithful to us. Now, we know that the Bible says he's faithful even when we are faithless. I understand. This is a different type of the same principle. It's saying, listen, you show your faithfulness to God and he'll prove his already faithfulness to you. So you can look back years later and remember, I remember when I was in that situation I remember when the wicked seemed to be getting away with things. I remember when this was happening and I stuck it out and I dwelled in the land and I trusted in God and I focused on his character and I developed faithfulness, developed faithfulness, developed faithfulness. And we can look back and be like, you know what? When I was faithful then, God was faithful to me. He brought me out. He secured me. He kept me safe. And so the next time you've inevitably, right? The next time you come to a place in your life, when the enemy seems to be winning, when things seem to be falling in, you can say, oh yeah, God was faithful to me then, and I'm going to remain faithful to him now, because I know, I know who I have believed in. I can trust in him. He says, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Don't run away, don't give up, cultivate, develop that skill of faithfulness. You see, when evil seems to be winning, We are to trust in the character of the Lord. It's a process. It needs to be developed, cultivated. So the question is this. Are you doing that? How well, on a scale of 1 to 10, do you know God? Just in your own head, think of a number. On a scale of 1 to 10, right? Now we know God is infinite. It's impossible to know him completely. So nobody in here is a 10, But you can know God more and more and more and more. And listen, the more you know God, the more you'll trust God. Amen? Amen. The more you know God, the more you trust him. When evil seems to be winning, trust in the character of the Lord. Number three, when evil seems to be winning, delight in the Lord. Look at verse number four of your Bible. Verse number four of chapter 37. He says, delight yourself in the Lord. That's pretty straightforward, right? But what does it mean to delight? In your notes, if you would, just make this note. Just just say, delight means to take pleasure in. Delight means to take pleasure in. What are some things you take pleasure in? 
We take pleasure in, as Americans in football, right? Sports. I take pleasure in food. <laughs> many, many of you maybe take pleasure in shopping. God has given us some good things to take pleasure in. Sex is a thing we take pleasure in, right? Inside the bonds of marriage, it's a good thing. I, I mean, there's tons of things we can go on and on about what we take pleasure in. And so what he's saying here is, listen, take pleasure in the Lord. Is that a weird concept, maybe? Take pleasure in the Lord. Warren Wearsby, in speaking about this word delight, says this. He says, it speaks of the abundance of the blessings we have in the Lord himself, totally apart from what he gives us. To enjoy the blessings and ignore the blesser is to practice idolatry. Yeesh. See, many people treat God like a genie, right, in a bottle. God, I need you. God, I need you. Here, let me rub the bottle. Come out. Help me. But the Bible says that's idolatry. See, God wants us to take delight, take pleasure, take joy just in him. How many of you are married or been married? Okay, when you got married, how awful in the vows would it have been if you were to say to your spouse, I'm so happy I get to marry you because I'm going to inherit a buttload of wealth. (laughs) Everybody like, that's shameful, right? If somebody said, I want to marry you because it's going to up my political status, right? You see, in marriage, we expect people to marry for love, to marry for the other person, for the pleasure of their company, because they enjoy that person. They want to be with that person. You know, it's no different with your relationship with God. God wants your company. He wants your companionship. He wants a relationship. He wants you to take pleasure in who he is, not just what he can give you. And he calls us in times of hardship, in times when the enemy is encroaching, he says, delight in the Lord. And too few Christians take delight in their Christ. There's a second promise here in verse number four. After that part, he says, delight yourself in the Lord. And then he says what? Everybody look at it. He says, and he will give you what? The desires of your heart. That's a big promise. That's promise number two. God will give you the desires of your heart. Now the difference between this promise and the first promise is what? One is conditional and one is unconditional. The unconditional one is God will punish the wicked. The conditional one is God will give you the desires of your heart. And it's preceded by the condition. What does he say? The first thing we need to do is trust in the Lord and then delight ourselves in the Lord and then he'll do what? Then he'll give you the desires of your heart. See, God wants you to, your trust. He wants your joy to be in him and then he'll give you the desires that you're seeking in your heart of hearts. And as you make God your delight because of who God naturally is, Your heart wants more of him. And as your heart wants more of him, he is eager to grant you the desire of your heart. Do you see how that works? It's a lot of people say, well, God just wants to make me happy. Well, yes, but he wants to make you happy in himself. God wants your heart to be so bent towards him that you love him. You want to spend more time with him. You want to listen to to, to him more than you want to watch TV, okay? Not saying TV's bad, of course. In moderation, those things are all right. You know, but you can really tell where your heart is in the time you spend. And so when you spend time with God and when you, you, you develop that relationship him, with him, when you come to him and you delight yourself in him, you take pleasure in him. No hands raised, but how many could say right now, I take pleasure in the Lord, in your own mind, in your own heart? Can you say that this morning? Well, I had to really search my heart and say, do I really take, would I rather spend time with God than time watching a football game? Would I rather spend time with the Lord and and, and taking pleasure and joy in him than eating a good meal, than watching a movie, than going for a walk, than spending time with my wife? Listen, the Bible says anything less is idolatry. Now, we're not talking about legalism here. You got a 24-7 study the scriptures. No, but your general desire in your heart should first and foremost be to Christ, to to God. Delight in the Lord and then he'll give you the desires of your heart. This promise that God will give you the desires of your heart, this is not a promise for people who want things, but for those who want more of God in their lives. That's who the promise is to. So the question this morning is this, do you want more of God? 
Not do you want God, because if you're here, you probably want God to some extent, extent. But listen, the question is, do you want more? More of God. Have you ever gotten in a relationship with somebody and you're like, that was fun. Let's do it tomorrow night, right? Can you hang out this night? Can you go out now? Can you go out, that, you know, and you're constantly wanting to spend time and want more time and more time and more time and more time. Listen, it's the same way with God. As you get a little bit of him and you start to trust him and see his character and see his goodness and see his love and see who he really is, what happens is your heart starts to hunger for him more and more and more. Listen, if you don't hunger for God, you need a new heart. <laughs> the Bible says that all who who thirst after godliness, they'll be satisfied. They'll, their thirst will be quenched. All those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they'll, they'll get that fulfillment and they'll get it in God. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Do you desire more of God? You see, when evil seems to be winning, we need to delight in the Lord. Amen? Number four, when evil seems to be winning, commit your way to the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Verse 5 of chapter 37. Everybody look at verse 5. It says this, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. Now he goes and says, trust also in him. He says it again, right? He also said it once. Remember, he said, trust in the Lord. But now he says it again. So he reemphasizes, but he says, commit your way to the Lord. Do you see the difference? The first part he's talking about, listen, as a person, you need to trust in God. You need to know God. You need to have that relationship with God. You need to lean on his character, understand who he is, trust in the Lord. Then he says, delight in the Lord, right? He's still talking personal, personal, personal. And he doesn't transfer to impersonal, but he kind of takes a, a little different step. And he says, now you need to not only take care of your personal relationship with God, but you need to trust your way, your path your life course to the Lord. And you see, when you're trusting in God and you know his character and your number one priority is delight, joy, pleasure in him, do you know what happens to your path? He makes it straight. The Bible says he, he makes it straight. Not even straight like this. Straight like this and straight like this. Very smooth, very straight. You know it's easy to make decisions. Why? Because you're trusting in the Lord. You see how this is beautiful, how the psalmist puts it together and God inspired it, of course. But he says, and listen, first of all, take care of your personal relationship with God. Trust in him, delight in him, make him your number one priority in life over everything else. And then when, once that's in place, then, you can, then your way can be straight and pure and, and your path can be right and he'll take care of that. Now what's interesting is this word commit is not like the word that we think of when we think commit. When we think commit, we think, you know, make a decision, just do it. And no, commit here means to roll off. To roll off your burden. How does that make sense in this context? It makes perfect sense. Listen, when evil encroaches, when it seems like evil is winning, when you look around and people seem to be getting away with things and the world seems to be collapsing on itself, he says, listen, Roll off your burden to him. Just let it slide right off. Just, just, just give it a little shake, you know, and just let it come on off. Give it to the Lord. As you trust in him, as you delight in him, you can roll your burden off to him. You think of 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care. Care is, means anxiety, worry, right? Fret on him. Why? Because he cares for you. See, when you delight in the Lord, you can commit your way to the Lord. Think of an example of maybe having the option to take another job. Or you have a choice to move here or move there. Or to marry this person or marry that person. Or to do this or not to do this. And you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, what should I do? Listen, if you're trusting in him already, if your delight and pleasure is already in him, you can take that burden and give it to him and say, you deal with it doesn't mean you don't make any decision at all. It gives you confidence in the decision. So many people think there's like one singular path that they have to follow, right? For God to bless their life. You got to go down this way. You got to follow his path. It turns right here. I don't think scripture indicates that. In fact, right here we see he says, listen, if you, do, if you trust in the Lord, if you delight in the Lord, then you roll your ways off to him. Listen, even if you take a wrong step, if you're trusting in him and delighting in him, guess what he's going to do? Nope, get over here, Dave. 
So you can have confidence, say, you know what? I'm going to take the job that I want. I'm going to take this job because whatever. And you're prayed up and you're studied up and you're delighting in God and trusting in God. And then the burdens just roll off because the pressure's like, oh my gosh, if I make a wrong decision, what's going to happen to me? No. Commit your way to the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And then it says this phrase. Everybody look at verse number five, the end. And he will do it. You see, the emphasis is on God. This whole passage is the emphasis on God. We don't have to do it in our own strength. Some of your versions might say, and he will bring it to pass. Some of your versions might say, he will do it. Some of your versions might say, he will act. What will he do? What will he act on? Well, it's found in the preceding verse. Look at verse number six. He says, he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. That's what he'll do. And this is the third promise, if you're taking notes. Promise number three, God will vindicate the righteous. You know, that brings my heart very, a great deal of peace and joy. Not because I'm righteous in my own self, but because of what God has done for me. God will vindicate the righteous. You know, I had a science teacher in school um, who... He, he decided to be a science teacher in a Christian school, and his father-in-law wanted him to do something else that, you know, was going to be a lot of money. He was going to make a lot of money, and, and this guy, he, he, did, he did the opposite because he felt that was God, what God wanted him to do. You know, God honored his life as he obeyed him. He was vindicated, so to speak. See, money passes, material possessions pass, all those things pass. But listen, when we obey God, when we trust in him, when we delight in him, he'll make your ways straight, he'll make your paths clear. And at the end, listen, he'll vindicate you. What does it mean to vindicate? Somebody tell me, scholars in here. Somebody give me a definition of vindicate. What's that? Let free? Vindicate means to to prove right. To, To make sure that people know, listen, This was the right way. This person chose the right way. They were proven right in their decision and in their life. And God promises you and me that he will vindicate us. He will vindicate the righteous. God will vindicate not only the righteous, but God will vindicate himself. You ever think about that? You ever known someone that slandered the name of God? That mocked the Lord? that walked in adversity to God and just said, I'm not going to follow your way. I'm not going to go down that path. You do your stupid Christian thing. I'm going to do my thing. And we'll see who's right at the end. The Bible says God will vindicate the righteous. But not only will he vindicate the righteous, he'll vindicate himself. How does he do this? He does it one way, through his son. Through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, God vindicates you. And he vindicates himself. He has proven right. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Philippians 2, 10 through 11, So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen. Are you listening this morning? Say amen. God will be vindicated. So when it looks like the enemy's coming in, when it, when it looks like evil's getting away with their, their things, when it looks like everything's going against God, remember, God has promised not only to vindicate himself, but to vindicate you through the blood of Jesus Christ. See, every person will stand before God. Every person will give account to their life, and, and God will say, listen, well, why, why should I let you in? The only way we're vindicated, if we say, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because I've trusted in him. I've accepted him as my Savior and Lord. When evil seems to be winning, commit your way to the Lord. And lastly, number five, when evil seems to be winning, rest in the Lord. Look at verse number seven. He says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now, when you think of rest, what do you think about? Some of you are doing it right now. <laughs> We think of sleep when we think of that type of thing. But listen, rest here, when he says rest, he means be silent. Be still. 
As my dad would say, sit still and shut up, right? <laughs> Just shh, 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 shh. You say, rest. Rest in the Lord, the psalmist says. You see, we don't like silence. We feel we have to say something. When it gets eerily quiet, watch. Somebody say something, right? <laughs> it gets awkward, right? But God says, no, 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 shh. Just be silent. Just sit before me. Be still. Rest in me. We don't like to sit still. We feel like, especially men, I don't know if this is you, if this is true, you, you feel like you got to do something, right? You feel like you got you to gotta say something, you got to do something, you got to act, you got to... God says, no, 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 no. Shh. Listen, listen. Shh. Just be still. Be silent. And it goes against everything in us. Let me ask you this this morning. We're almost done. When was the last time you simply sat in silence before the Lord? Falling asleep doesn't count. (laughs) When's the last time you got before God? Maybe in a park, maybe in a quiet room in your home. You say, I I don't have time. You don't understand. I got this and I got kids. I got that. I got that. Listen, God calls us to make time. Rest not only includes waiting silently and patiently, it includes obviously waiting. Resting includes waiting. See, unless we learn to wait silently before God, we will never experience his peace. Some of y'all some of y'all are so like tied up on the inside. You know? I gotta sit down. <laughs> You're so worried about everything in life. And I've, I've been there, man. I, I can be a worry wart, you know. With this church, I worry to sin. And I repent. And I try to give it to the Lord. And I repent. And I try to give it to the Lord. But you're the same way. Whether it's your kids you worry about or your financial situation or your future or life decisions or your spouse or relationship, friends, whatever. We all have anxiety, right? We all have worry. We all think and think and think, and God says, listen, stop acting, stop speaking, stop worrying, stop fretting, and rest in me. Just take a chill pill. (laughs) Just take a moment and just spend some silent moments, some silent minutes still before him, listening to the voice of the Lord. But it's not a vacuum. It's not, there's nothing, it's not that there's nothing in there. Listen, he, pre- he preceded all this with what? What did he say? Remember? Trust in him first. Focus on his character. So when you're sitting there in silence, you think about his character. You think about his goodness, his provision, his love for you. You delight in him. You take pleasure in having a relationship with him. You commit your way to him and your plans. You say, Lord, you have it all. And then you can go, ah. <gasps> Roll those burdens off and rest in him. What a great quote. Unless we learn to wait silently before God, we will never experience his peace. You know why you don't experience peace in your life? You've never waited on God. You've never sat silently on God. You've never just spent time with him in the stillness and quietness. Now, does this mean we do nothing when evil strikes? Of course not. If you think that, you're a fool. <laughs> Many times in the Bible, God calls us to act, calls us to stand up against evil. But also throughout the word of God, more times than not, what God is calling you and me to do is to be still. You know, all in the the great Old Testament passages, even the New Testament, you know when things were really like, boom, you know, wow, God has really moved, God has really acted. You think about what people were doing. What were believers doing? Not much, usually praying. Sitting still, you think about the upper room, you think about all the miracles in the Old Testament, they were hemmed in before they crossed over the sea, right? Nothing they could do. You see, when God really works in someone's life, you want to know someone who has power in their life and impact in their life, it's someone who can sit still and silently before God, and it's a priority in their life. When evil seems to be winning, rest in the Lord. So quickly reviewing, and then we're closing. First thing, don't fret, Right? Get your focus off the enemy, off the evil, off of the things that other people are doing. Instead, trust in the Lord. Secondly, delight in the Lord. Third, commit your way to the Lord. Rest in the Lord. Now, how do we do this? 
How do we trust in the Lord, delight in the Lord, commit our way to the Lord, and rest in the Lord? How do we practically flesh this out? You have to get alone with God. Now, for the past two years, I've been talking about this thing about getting in the Word of God, praying with God, getting alone with God. And you say, David, do you have anything new? Listen, I have an endless supply of messages. Why am I hammering this like nobody's business? It's the most important thing in your spiritual life. Unless you get alone with God, in his word, in prayer, silently, being still before him, you will never experience the power of God in your life. You will never mature spiritually in your life. You have to get alone with God. Say it with me, ready? Say, I have to get alone with God, ready? I have to get alone with God. One more time, say it like you mean it. I have to get alone with God. You got to do it. Make time, whatever it takes, and start small. It doesn't mean you have to spend a whole day, you know, and be a monk or something. Just take a few minutes and say, okay, on this day, at this time, no one's interfering. No one's coming in, 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 in that, that time slot. And I'm going to take some time, and I'm going to bring the word of God, and I'm going to bring my heart that's ready to hear from God, and I'm going to get silent, and I'm going to get still, and I'm going to listen to God. Make it a weekly habit, then make it a daily habit. Get alone with God. You see, as you get alone with God, follow me. We're almost done. You follow me, say amen. As you get alone with God, listen to what happens. You don't fret because you're focused on him. How can you worry about things when you're in contact and sitting before the person who is omniscient, (laughs) omnipotent, he's all-powerful, all-knowing, in control of all things, as you get alone with God, you trust his character through his word. You get in the word and you see who he is and you think he'd never do anything bad to hurt me. I love him. He loves me. It's all good, right? As you get alone with God, you find pleasure and joy in who he is. You begin to see who he is and you love him more and more. As you get alone with God and you pray and you roll and cast your cares on him and your life's plans, man, the worry and the stress melt away. And then lastly, as you get still and as you get silent and as you wait on God, you experience peace in your life. Do you want that this morning? We all do, right? You have to get alone with God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes at this time? No one looking around, heads back. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest